Are we camera ready? Okay. Okay, morning guys. Okay. My name is Sarah Rutherford Smith. You should recognize me from your study guides. If you don't recognize me, you don't know your study guides well enough, right? Okay, you can call me Sarah, you can call me Mrs. Smith, I don't mind. Today we're going to be discussing legal philosophy. Now, I'm pretty sure that all of you have heard some bad stories about legal philosophy and you're all quite worried about this module. Am I right? Okay, <coughs> you're all wrong. Legal philosophy has a pretty consistently high pass rate. Okay? Most of our students pass this module and most of our students pass well. Right? However, we have learned a couple of lessons over the years. Number one, if legal philosophy is towards the end of the exam session, students don't do so well. And if there is an exam the day before legal philosophy, students don't do so well. So what have we learned from this? You can't cram for this subject, right? I'm supposed to tell you as a lecturer that you can't cram for any subject, right? However, I was also a student a, a while ago, so we're going to be realistic. But legal philosophy, if you cram, it's not going to happen for you, okay? You have to work consistently throughout the semester for this module. Right. Okay, so in legal philosophy, okay, let's start again, right? I'm sure a lot of you in your life have sat down and you've thought about, like, big life questions. What is the meaning of life? Why am I here? What is the purpose of things, right? Legal philosophy is trying to answer the t same type of big questions, but we're trying to answer them in regard to the law. So what is law? Where does law come from? What is justice? How do judges decide cases? Or how should judges decide cases? Okay. How should society be structured and regulated? Okay, those are what we call big questions questions, and we're trying to find answers to those questions. And what we do in the subject is we look at different answers to all of these questions or to some of these questions throughout history, okay? And because society has changed considerably as long as we have historical evidence of, right, the answers to those questions tend to be different, okay? So we look at examples of answers to these questions throughout history. And where do we start? Who can tell us where we start? What's the first era known as? Okay, we start in the pre-modern era. Okay. I'm gonna write the term big questions at the top, so that we keep these in mind as we go through all the different philosophies, okay? Right. And we start with pre-moderns, okay? What can you tell me about pre-modern society? What was it like? What are the characteristics? Okay, what's the first one? Okay, they are homogenous. Right? What does homogenous mean? Okay. Everybody looks the same, they think the same, they act the same. Okay. Have you seen the movie 300? This is Sparta, you know that movie? Okay. Um, that is the type of civilization that we are talking about here. They are incredibly small communities, right? The reason why there were only 300 warriors was because there were only 300 warriors, okay? They're very small communities. Um, because they're very small, they don't have a lot of interaction <coughs> with other cities, right, with other societies, okay? They don't have cars or trains or bicycles or whatever like we do, okay? So they don't get out much. There isn't a lot of interaction. There is a bit of interaction, but not much, okay? So everybody looks the same, they think the same, they act the same. 
And because everybody does the same things, right? Because you act the same way that your grandparents acted and that your parents acted, you think that the way that you behave and the society that you live in must be right, okay? So what is the second characteristic? There is a natural order, right? Okay, because everybody acts the same and they think the same and because you think that this must be the right way to think, okay, you think that this must come from some sort of a higher power, that it must be God-given, right? I, that it is metaphysical. So we have some sort of a metaphysical belief, okay? And this, uh, and then what are we forgetting? Common good, okay? Everybody acts for the common good because you're such a small society, right? You have to look after each other. Okay, and because everybody lives in these types of societies and they have this kind of natural order, the way that your parents did things is the way that you do things, right? and you believe that it comes from some sort of net of physical power, you come to believe in a thing called, what am I, what am I thinking about? Natural law, right? Who can give me the definition of natural law? Okay, I want the exact definition. You're almost there. Okay. It is a pre-political, metaphysical yardstick against which we measure human conduct. All right? Is everybody with me? Okay? You can see how these types of societies lead you to believe that there must be some kind of metaphysical yardstick against which we measure human conduct. Okay. So now that we have discussed the characteristics of pre-modern society. We give you examples of pre-modern philosophers. Okay, I'm going to keep that definition up here. Who is the first that we discuss? Plato, Plato. right. Okay, now I am not going to be discussing each philosopher with you in that much detail. It's going to take too long. We're going to be here all day, right? So I'm going to give you a way to understand each philosopher. You're going to have to go back to your study guide and flesh it out, all right? What is the natural law for Plato? It's a word I'm looking for. What is it? Ideals, right? I deals. Plato believes that in this metaphysical realm, there is an ideal for everything. So I'm going to ask you a question. Is this a chair? What if I think it's a stool? <laughs> well, we may have a problem. <laughs> right. Plato thinks that in this metaphysical realm, there is an ideal chair against which we can measure all human chairs to decide whether this is a chair or not, whether this is a chair or a stool, right? Now, I'm being very sort of silly using a chair because we're talking about much more serious issues. Plato is concerned about things like justice. He says that in this metaphysical realm, there must be an ideal of justice. 
against which we can measure human conduct to decide whether that is good or bad or right or wrong. Okay? Who can access these ideals? Okay. Plato says, now you have to remember that Plato comes from this pre-modern society with these type of characteristics, right? And he wants to, A, he kind of wants to answer the big questions that he's got in his head, but he also wants to justify the type of society that he lives in. And in the society that he lives in, who's really important? Well, Greek men are really important, okay? If you're not a Greek man, unlucky for you, okay? If you don't happen to be Greek, you're a slave, okay? And if you happen to be a woman, you're nothing, okay? So he wants to justify that hierarchy, okay? So he says that you are either a warrior, a worker, or a philosopher king. This is his hierarchy, okay? You can only be one of those things if you're a man and you're Greek. If you can't be one of those things, you don't have a role to play in Greek society, okay? The philosopher kings are the academics. They're the intellectuals. They're the people who sit down and they think about things so intensely that they are able to access this metaphysical realm, and therefore they are able to implement natural law. They are able to decide what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. They can access the ideals as the yardstick against which to measure human conduct. All right. Who is the second person that we talk about? Aristotle. What forms the natural law for Aristotle? It's not the word I'm looking for. Forms. Right. Sorry, I have forms. Okay. Aristotle says that everything has its purpose. Everything is matter, and it's moving towards its forms. The forms are the ideal against which we can measure human conduct, all right? Aristotle also has a hierarchy. We call this, sorry, we call this the ideal state, right? Okay? <laughs> Aristotle also has a conception of the ideal state. What is important to Aristotle? You should know this from your assignments. Okay, Aristotle says education is very important. And it's education to be a political animal. All right? Okay, you're educated to play a political role in society. What does this mean for women? Because the only people who get educated are men, right? So women cannot play a political role in society, okay? So again, we have that hierarchy where men are on top and everybody else, well, Greek men are on top and everybody else is nothing, okay? And that is his ideal state. Okay, so you can see how we get from the natural law and the consequences of that type of thinking, all right? And then who is the third person who I'll just fit in over here that we deal with? Okay. Right. What is the natural law for Aquinas? This one's really easy. God, right? And depending on your opinion, the Bible. Okay, religious texts, okay? Some people would argue that religious texts cannot be a form of natural law because they are written down. Some people would say that they are examples of natural law. As we know from legal philosophy, there is never a right or a wrong answer, only good or bad arguments. 
Professor Kreisler and I have spent hours arguing about this, okay? We still haven't convinced each other either way, okay? So the natural law, God, and we find this natural law in the Bible, is a pre-political metaphysical yardstick against which we measure human conduct, okay? And Aquinas, like the other two, also has a hierarchy. At the top of the hierarchy is God. Then, because he's also trying to justify the type of society in which he lives, and you have to remember that we have moved a couple of centuries forward in history now, and we are now in medieval Europe, right? So he's trying to justify a society, so next comes the king, right? Under that is man, under that is woman, and under that is animals, right? We don't really discuss that in the study guide, but I put it in because both me and the other lecturer for this module, Mr. de Villiers, happened to be vegan. So we don't particularly like Aquinas very much, right? Okay, so you can see that with Aquinas, from this natural law, we get the consequences, the hierarchy of how he structures his society, okay? Aquinas has been very influential. Aquinas and what he said lasted for a good number of centuries. All right. Then, under the pre-moderns, we discuss one other example of natural law. What is that? What is it? African philosophy, okay? I'm really running out of space here, but okay. Right. Now, African philosophy doesn't neatly fit into these conceptions. It's very easy to discuss these in the sort of order that I've been discussing them, right? African philosophy doesn't neatly fit into that same order, okay? That doesn't make it any less. It doesn't make it any worse. It doesn't make it any better. It just makes it different. All right? But let's, let's try. What, for African legal philosophy, is the natural law? Okay, the ancestors, right? That's a good answer, and it's not wrong. But we don't really discuss that in the study guide. What do we discuss? What's the other one? I think I heard it. Ubuntu, right? What is Ubuntu? Who can tell me? Okay, there is no exact definition of Ubuntu, is there? Okay. Can we touch Ubuntu? Can you see Ubuntu? Where does Ubuntu come from? It's metaphysical, right? And yet, Ubuntu, being metaphysical is a yardstick against which we measure human conduct, isn't it? Okay, that's what we did in which case? In S versus Makwanyani. Okay, in S versus Makwanyani, Ubuntu formed the pre-political metaphysical yardstick against which me we measure human conduct. Okay. Is there a hierarchical society under African legal philosophy? Yes. Okay. Historically, yes. African societies were hierarchical. Uh -huh. But we live in an African society, right? We're in South Africa. We still use Ubuntu. Okay? Do we live in a hierarchical society today? Yes. <coughs> Okay, we have a, a, an argument that we still do. Why do you say that we still do? Because we are still believing in a patriarchal society. We, are a, a, we, we still focus on patriarchy. Okay. Uh, men rules. Okay, so this student is arguing that we still live in a patriarchal society where man is in charge. How many women agree with that? Okay, two. Right, you have a valid argument. It is possible to argue that, okay? However, our constitution says that we don't live in a, a patriarchal society, okay? According to our constitution, we live in an equal society. 
We are not a hierarchical society anymore, okay? Legally, we are no longer a hierarchical society, okay? <coughs> Yet, this idea of natural law is still very relevant to us, okay? Aquinas concept of natural law is relevant to some people, okay? To other people, it isn't relevant. These guys, not as relevant. So although African legal philosophy doesn't sit as comfortably into this kind of conception of natural law as we have it, or pre-modern societies of w as we had them, it's probably the most important for us, isn't it? Okay. Right. Having said that these guys aren't quite as relevant as African legal philosophy, you can always interpret them into modern situations, okay? That is one of the tricks with legal philosophy, is that you have to learn to interpret the philosophies into situations, okay? That's what we do in your assignments, right? We gave you a modern text from a newspaper, I think, from last year, right? And yet we asked on Aristotle. Because even though he is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old, centuries old, okay, still relevant today. Right, are you with me? Okay, so let's look at S versus Marquignani. We are all familiar with this case. We all know what it's about, right? Okay, if you don't know what it's about, we have a bigger problem. <laughs> right. Okay. Can you interpret S versus Maquignani according to Plato's ideals? Anybody have any ideas? Okay, the answer is yes, you can, right? Because you can see the constitutional court judges acting as philosopher kings, right? What did they do? They sat down and they thought very, very hard, and they did research about whether the death penalty was justice, okay? So perhaps they accessed that ideal of justice, and they said, well, according to the natural law, according to the ideal of justice, the death penalty is not justice, okay? So we can interpret them to be acting as philosopher kings. Everybody with me on that one? Can we interpret them according to Aristotle's forms? Yes, okay? Perhaps the death penalty is moving towards its form, right? Perhaps the ideal form of justice is to not have the death penalty. Now, I'm pretty sure that, unfortunately, a lot of you in this room would argue that the death penalty needs to change again, and justice would actually be having the death penalty, okay? So you can see justice evolving. Perhaps it hasn't yet reached its form, all right? Can we interpret it according to Aquinas' natural law? Well, obviously, thou shalt not kill, right? And, of course, we can interpret it using Ubuntu. That's what they did. All right. So is everybody happy with, pre -modern, with the pre-modern era? Right? Simple, isn't it? Okay, and you see how... Well, that's what they did. The judges used Ubuntu. They said that the death penalty wasn't Ubuntu. Okay? Right. So, and you can see when we're talking about the big questions. What is law? How, is, how should society be structured? We're getting to the ideal state. Aristotle's ideal state. Aquinas' ideal state. That is how society should be structured. They're trying to answer big questions. What is law? Well, it's the natural law. Okay? So we're trying to answer the big questions. But also to answer the things, one judge who quoted when they were deciding this asked, we cannot stoop 
to a level of a criminal to kill criminals. And you're saying that that would be Ubuntu? Y yes. Okay. So because if they kill them, it means they are also criminals. So uh, the judge was refusing to, to, to stoop to, to that to level. a lower level of a, what, of a criminal mm -hmm. to execute criminals. All right. So you can see that the concept of Ubuntu and a pre-modern philosophy was still very relevant in modern day South Africa. Right. Yeah. Oh, so you're talking about the hierarchy? Yes. yes. Okay, so that, that, that hierarchy still exists, right? Well, I mean, it does kind of depend on your opinion, okay? And it, and it also depends because in South Africa, we are no longer a homogenous society, right? We don't look the same, we don't think the same, we don't act the same anymore, okay? So some people would agree with you and say that we do still have that hierarchy where there is God and where there is man. My, for myself, I wouldn't conform to that hierarchy, okay? What is important for African legal philosophy is that the concept of Ubuntu, although it is centuries old, is still relevant in South Africa. Okay? Right. So we shouldn't discuss our personal opinions here, but rather... It depends. Okay, we're going to discuss the exam and how to answer questions at the end, where I will discuss where your personal...